Stories from the East and West. Dear passengers, welcome to Warsaw Chopin Airport. The weather is a bit overcast and the temperature is 19 degrees Celsius. We wish you a pleasant stay and hope to see you again very soon. On behalf of all our crew, thank you for choosing our company as your airline today. I have a question for you, John. Do you remember the first time you landed in Warsaw? Yes, I do, actually. It was a beautiful summer's day back in the mid-1980s. Okay, so you just landed on a beautiful, clear summer day. What is the first thing you notice? That's a no-brainer. It's the Palace of Culture. It sticks out like nothing else I've ever seen. Anywhere, in fact. And especially as a kid, I was totally in awe at this monstrosity of a thing right slap bang in the centre of the city. My first thought when I saw it was, that's Hogwarts. That's the Hogwarts School of Magic and Wizardry right there. But I found that since it's got nothing to do with Harry Potter, the palace was actually given to Poland by Joseph Stalin and the Soviet Union. And even if it has a very controversial history, it became the heart and soul of Warsaw. And in today's episode, we're going to find out how that came to be. You know full well that what you've just said is loaded with contradiction, right? I mean, how can a Stalinist building become a symbol of a democratic city? Yes, it is loaded with contradiction, but that's precisely the story we want to unravel in today's episode. Hi, I'm John. And I'm Leah, and this is Stories from the Eastern West. Today we will tell you the story of the Palace of Culture and Science, which proudly towers over Warsaw. And just to give you an idea of its size, it's almost 800 feet tall, it has 43 floors, and it consumes as much energy as a town of 30,000 people. We'll also discuss its surprising style in comparison to its surroundings, we will reveal a couple of its mysteries as well, and we will have special guests who will tell us how the palace was born at a time when Warsaw almost ceased to exist. First we met with a writer. My name is Beata Hmontowska, I'm a writer and a journalist and a founder, co-founder of uh, the association uh, Stacja Muranów. Then we met with a university professor. Uh, my name is Michał Murawski and I'm an anthropologist of architecture. Uh, I'm based at um, Queen Mary University of London. So let's get started. Our little corner of the Eastern West, as we like to call it, meaning of course Central and Eastern Europe, was a bad place to be during World War II. The area was the first target of the German Blitzkrieg, which was a massive invasion from both air and ground, and it was then delivered a crushing blow by a subsequent betrayal by the Soviet army. And Warsaw was in the middle of all of this. That's right. So after two failed uprisings... That's the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising and the subsequent Warsaw Uprising. After both of them failed, the Nazi retribution was to set the entire city on fire. And that means that approximately 84% of Warsaw's buildings were destroyed or damaged beyond repair. So it was just a flat field full of ruins, full of uh, rubble, just like a black hole in the middle of the city. In 1939, Warsaw had a population of about 1,300,000 people. In 1944, there were only a few thousand people left in the city. Fast forward to 1945, the war is over and Poland's fate is being decided without any sort of Polish input. The Yalta Conference gives rise to the Iron Curtain. Yes, indeed it does, with Poland falling on the eastern side. Yes, and the conditions were so dire after the war that Poland needed outside help if it wanted to rebuild, and Yalta blocked any possibility of Western funding. So it left Poland completely dependent on the Soviet Union. I read somewhere that the damage was so huge, they even considered moving the capital to another city. I think that's true, but on the other hand, it's a bit hard to believe, so we asked Beata. The Polish communist government, which was in fact uh, installed here by the Russians, uh, took power. And uh, this government was installed in Lublin, 
uh, in the eastern Poland. A group of Soviet architects went to Warsaw to have a look around and determine what could be rebuilt, what couldn't be rebuilt, and then their job was to write reports and let the USSR know where things stood. Uh, so it's it's true that uh, in the very beginning, when the war was almost over, uh, the, this so-called Lublin government uh, was considering uh, even moving uh, the capital uh, from Warsaw to some less destroyed city. They considered Łódź, which is a huge city right in the middle of Poland, and obviously Krakow, which used to be Poland's capital a couple of centuries ago. But it was for a very short time, because this inspection uh, checked out and turned back with the information that it's possible somehow to recreate the city. But in the end, it's almost as if the former inhabitants of Warsaw took the decision themselves because they started coming, they started rebuilding little by little. To give you an idea, we have a really great description by Marek Żuławski from when he visited Warsaw in the spring of 1946. Warsaw is a reanimated ruin a corpse that has refused to stay in its grave. It's filled with unbelievable energy, like Frankenstein's monster. Its crowds are enormously active, with no trace of apathy and everything done with a trot. The bars, cafes and restaurants set up within the concrete carcasses of buildings are always full. Nobody seems to notice the weakened ceilings hanging menacingly above them. It's as though everybody has agreed to pretend that Warsaw still exists, and this new colossal fiction has become more powerful than reality. Terrible conditions, but... It was obvious that they want to live here. On the other hand, though, could they reinvent the city from scratch? You know, build something completely new, some sort of super-functional modernist dream city? Those sorts of utopian ideas were very popular at the time, right? Yes, it was a -a one-of-a-kind opportunity, but also a -a one-of-a-kind challenge, I'd say. Modernist architects were thrilled to jump on board and start designing, especially since the original pre-war Warsaw was a very capitalist city, from both an architectural and social point of view. Now many people go back to uh, to, to, to archive photos, to some memoirs, and say that... It was such a beautiful city, the Paris of the North. And of course, the memory, the time changes the perspective because um, there were also really poor conditions, uh, especially in the old town area where people lived uh, with no uh, water, for example. As is often the case, rich people lived in the city center, while the poor and working class could only afford to live on the outskirts or even on the eastern side of the Vistula, which is the river that runs right through Warsaw. The tenement houses were overcrowded, there was not much light, not much green. Uh, It was not so beautiful. Of course, there were good streets and bad streets. There was definitely an intention to make the new Warsaw city that was equally accessible and affordable for all. Utopian, you mean, right? Maybe, but think of the circumstances. You're rebuilding the country's capital from almost nothing, and all of this is taking place under communism, which I think some people might call another utopia. It gave the modernists hope that their ideas might come true, but on the other hand, there were other people with different priorities, and their opponents were much more conservative, and they saw the reconstruction process completely differently. And the the other group were like um, some art historians, people who were... Uh, stating that this old city should rebuild in the former uh, states because of the memory, that the people uh, were emotionally attached to some symbols. Uh, they knew the city like, like it was, and it would be easier for them like to pass through the war trauma and start a new life in the shapes they, they used to know. So a bit of a contradiction going on here, I'd say. So there was this big discussion, and at the end, um, the solution which was chosen, uh, it was like a mixture, so... They decided to recreate areas that had a symbolic significance. The old town, the royal castle, the boulevard that led from them down to the royal gardens. But at the same time, they started drawing up completely new plans for other parts of the city. And these plans were very modernist and almost revolutionary in a way. So the first plans, uh, for example, uh, Maciej Nowicki, one of the famous Polish architects, also worked for the Corolla Corbusier, 
he was really brave uh, while making the sketches. They don't resemble anything what we can see now, because then... Everything was changed according to a new doctrine that um, came from Moscow in 19, which was brought from from Moscow in 1949, and it was social realist style. Social realism, in case you're not familiar with it, was an artistic and architectural ideology based on communist values, like the liberation of the working class. So it uses very realistic images. Uh, it had to be implemented uh, and um, all the architects who, who really believed in a totally different uh, like aesthetic school uh, had, were forced uh, were forced to uh, to say they were wrong and uh, and to start uh, uh, designing in the, in this new style that was in 1949. Social realism was the mandatory style of architecture for all Soviet satellite countries, and that made urban planning significantly harder. So basically what you're saying is that it was a total and utter mess. Keep in mind that all of Warsaw at that moment was one big construction site, major chaos, but it's here that our story really begins. One day, Yusuf Sagalin, who was the architect-in-chief for rebuilding Warsaw, received a classified telegram about an upcoming visit by none other than the infamous Vyacheslav Molotov, who was of course very close to Stalin. The telegram wrote that Molotov would probably come up with a quote-unquote spontaneous offer to build a high-rise in Warsaw. And there were also instructions attached. Don't go into details, take a positive position overall and don't look confused. And the day after, what do you know, Molotov says... How would you like a high-rise building, just like one of ours in Warsaw? Sigalin followed his instructions and answered, why not? And that was that. What? Wait. He just said, why not? And that was how they decided to build a skyscraper in the middle of a ruined city? I mean, okay, I get it. And at the same time, I don't get it at all. That was what the Soviet decision-making process looked like, John. The palace was Stalin's own idea, so no one could say anything other than, why not? Thanks very much, we're super excited. Especially since the palace was supposed to be a gift from one nation to another. It was a gift. Uh, You had to take it as it was and what the ideas of the of the Russian um, architects team was as well. Basically Soviet propaganda, big time. If you read the documents, uh, the discussions uh, uh, concerning uh, the design of the palace and its uh, surroundings, Uh, you know, the the Russians had always the last word. You really think they decided the whole thing by saying, why not? I mean, there must have been additional meetings with architects and city planners, you know, conferences, debates, stuff like that. Yes, but not before the main decision was taken. And apparently the decision was taken just like the legend says it did. Listen to what Mihao thinks of it. Well, uh, yeah, the, these anecdotes, I mean, there's so many different anecdotes around the palace and I still i am certainly not, I haven't been able to trace or haven't really made an effort to trace all of them and to see where they come from and to, and to verify whether they are true or not. But the story about Sigalin is one that he tells himself in his, in his memoirs. Um, and he tells it very convincingly, um, but he tells it in a very sort of... um, He tells it in quite an affected way, so in a way which is almost too perfect. But the real problem with all this was that a gigantic palace was the last thing Warsaw needed in 1949. Four years after the war and the city was still mostly rubble, now with hundreds of thousands of people with nowhere to live. The infrastructure was basically non-existent, there were problems with water and electricity, And this big, bizarre palace was meant to officially count as Soviet aid in rebuilding Poland. Across Western Europe, meanwhile, actual money was being distributed to repair war-torn countries. Nobody bothered with building palaces in the middle of ruins. They obviously weren't into blatant propaganda like the Soviets were then. But what happened next? 
The Polish architects didn't know what to expect. They were asked to go to Moscow for a meeting, and there they learned that almost everything had already been decided. Adin. The building must be built in the Stalinist Gothic style. Dwa. Left Rudnia, the architect of Moscow University, must be its designer. Three. The construction will be financed and carried out by the USSR. Four. Materials from the USSR will be used for the most part, and Soviet builders will be hired. Five. The Polish government will decide the exact spot in Warsaw where it will be built as well as how the building will be used. Yes, they were building a 43-floor skyscraper with no clue what to do with it. Shit. Construction will start mid-1952 and will take only two and a half to three years. Two and a half to three years for a 43-floor skyscraper in the 1950s? Yes, so you can imagine they got to work really quickly. Over the next few months, many Soviet officials came to Poland to gather the information they needed to start the project. They were invited to tour Poland and presented with typical Polish architecture along the way so that their design could match the Polish urban landscape. But it doesn't match at all. Yeah, that didn't work out at all. In the end, I guess they had a choice between keeping things harmonious or going all out with Stalinist Gothic and social realism. And they obviously chose the second option. But to be fair, if you do look at the building's details, there are quite a lot of little elements that are evocative of Polish folklore, so there's that. It does all seem very Soviet in the way it was carried out. Yes, and soon the propaganda started taking center stage, as you can imagine. Almost every step was finished earlier than planned just to show how efficient Soviet workers were, or to commemorate some communist anniversary, even things as absurd as the month of massification of the community for Soviet-Polish friendship. I'm all about massification, that's everybody's favorite holiday. I might have forgotten to celebrate that one last year. Ooh, better watch out, they'll get the thought police on you, Leia. Yeah, whatever, John. However, the workers and engineers, in addition to working several shifts in a row, were constantly filmed and interviewed. Listen to how the National Television Chronicle sings their praises. Pomnik braterstwa pracy i przyjaźni naszych narodów. Pałac kultury i nauki w darze dla Warszawy. It is a monument to our peoples, to our brotherhood of work and friendship. The Palace of Culture and Science as a gift for Warsaw. Pałac kultury to dla naszych robotników Uniwersytet Budownictwa. A dla nas wszystkich wspaniały, trwały pomnik. For our workers, the Palace of Culture is a university of construction, and for all of us, a magnificent, lasting monument to the friendship of the Stalinist nations. There was also an observation deck to watch the construction site. So the builders were working and they had people standing by and applauding, which I find absolutely hilarious to imagine. What is not so funny, though, is that with all that rushing, there were deaths. I think it was 16 Soviet workers who died, or at least that's the official number, but knowing how these things go, it could be more. That's quite a death toll, but I'm guessing they were ready for much more had it been necessary. After all, a propaganda gift from nation to nation can't be delayed, right? Exactly. And guess what? They made their deadline? It was a close call, but yes, they did. On June 21st, 1955, the ambassador of the Soviet Union and the prime minister of the People's Republic of Poland signed a transfer deed. That was the moment the construction of the Joseph Stalin Palace of Culture and Science was over. And the very next day, the palace was open to the public. And here it stands. It's been 60 years and the palace is still in amazing condition. Originally it was white and now it's a little bit grayer because of the pollution. But otherwise I think you could say it looks brand new. Leah, I must say that it feels we've only scratched the surface of this story. What were people's reaction when it was finally built? I guess it must have been impressive to many people, right? But did Varsovians actually like it or not? Is it still named after Stalin? And anyway, why wasn't it pulled down after Poland became free of Soviet influence? I completely agree with you that we only scratched the surface. The Palace of Culture gradually changed Warsaw and it even became an essential part of the city over the next 60 years. 
and that's a whole other story. So why aren't we telling it? We are. Our next episode is going to be about everything that happened inside and around the palace. So if you want to know what sort of shenanigans take place in a Soviet palace, be sure to download our next episode. We'll tell you why there are several cats on the palace's payroll. Uh, exactly 16 cats live in the palace basement. How people used to send letters straight to the palace. So they are addressed, dear palace, uh, this is my situation, blah, blah, blah. And how a group of daring businessmen wanted to dismantle and relocate it. Uh, some people think that the palace's side wings uh, should be chopped off so that the palace is much more of a sort of a freestanding skyscraper like uh, uh, the Empire State Building or like a, like, a, like a North American skyscraper. Last but not least, we'll give you an audio tour around the palace. You can imagine spending eight hours here translating. Uh, everybody spoke, smoked cigarettes during the communism, so when you smoke cigarettes here for eight hours, you could faint. So they just made small holes in the ceiling as air conditioning. Make sure you don't miss it. This episode of Stories from the East and West was a Wirewalker studio production for Culture.pl. Our team included Wojciech Oleksiak, Adam Żuławski, John Beecham, Nitzan Reisner, Lea Berio, and our intern Michael Keller. A big thanks to Berta Homontowska and Michał Murawski for joining us on this episode. Make sure to read Murawski's book, The Palace Complex, if you're interested in learning more about the palace. We'd also like to thank the America program at the Adam Mickiewicz Institute for all their help. To see the notes from this episode, just tap the show out in your podcast app or visit storiesfromtheeastandwest.com. If you enjoyed the show, make sure to subscribe for future episodes. And remember to give us a review on Apple Podcasts. It'll help others find the podcast too. <laughs>